So uh, warm good morning to all of you <clears throat> uh, and welcome uh, to the uh, inaugural session uh, of the India Responsible Capital Conference 2023. Um, really nice to uh, see uh, our PhD students, research scholars, and a couple of faculty members uh, over here. And I also welcome all the participants who are joining us uh, live over the webinar, uh, especially all of our students uh, who are there on the webinar mode. Uh, they will be joining us as and when their classes get over uh, and in the breaks they will drop by. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, the conference, uh, you know, we were conspiring to do something like this uh, since a year. Uh, you know, uh, given the mandates of both the Arundugal Center for uh, ESG research as well as uh, Mishra Center for Finance. Um, over a cup of coffee uh, about six months ago, uh, you know, right over there uh, near uh, uh, Trans Cafe, Cafe, we were thinking about can we join forces and uh, uh, see if we can put together a platform where uh, practitioners, uh, academicians, researchers, uh, and uh, as well as you know students and public in general can come together and see what is happening. Now. Uh, that alliance uh, turned out to be, you know, today, if you look back, it looks a little prescient because uh, if you look at the uh, conversation in COP28, uh, pretty much uh, a bulk of the discussions are around the concept of how finance or green finance could become an enabler uh, for various uh, you know, trajectories that the IPCC is uh, chalking out. <clears throat> the fact that we are talking about finance as an enabler uh, means that there are present day challenges. You know, as, as many of you as, as students of finance would know that when, whenever it comes to finance, we are basically talking about uh, intertemporal allocation of resources. So uh, if we talk of economics as you know, allocation of scarce resources, we're talking about intertemporal allocation of scarce resources. And the fact that finance has become an important element of enabling sustainability transition means that what is required today needs to be allocated from the future. It also means that the technology curve doesn't fit uh, with the market economics uh, mandate. Many of the solutions are not in the money in the current term. To make them in the money, you need instruments like <clears throat> viability gap funding, you need instruments like subsidies, you also need instruments uh, like taxes and also enabling frameworks like market. So uh, this turns out to be a good uh, uh, you know, conspiracy uh, uh, going forward yeah, and good collaboration. Um, uh, thank you so much to the Mishra Center as well as uh, co-chair Professor Naman for making this happen. Uh, as an inaugural uh, session, uh, we have panels and uh, research tracks that uh, my colleague would be explaining that in detail. And we are also grateful to our two keynote speakers, uh, Professor Carolyn Flammer uh, and Mr. Amit Sinha. Uh, professor Carolyn is uh, coming from uh, Columbia University. She's a professor uh, at the School of International Policy and uh, of Climate, a joint appointment with the uh, School of Business. <coughs> Many of you PhD students would know her as the Associate Editor of Management Science and uh, Strategic Management Journal. We were uh, soothing her concerns in the morning over coffee that please do not consider this as a bribe. Uh, she, she said, um, you know, of course, I will accept all, all gifts, uh, but I will make sure that my integrity stays uh, upright and uphold uh, that high standards. Nonetheless, it also gives an opportunity for us to build up the conversation uh, with what are the expectations uh, of leading journals like Management Science and a strategic management journal in terms of scholarship. Uh, where is the moving frontier on scholarship? What is the expectation on scholarship at that at that at that level? Uh, so I'm hoping we will seed many those many of those side conversation uh, going uh, along the, along the way. Uh, uh, Mr. Sinha uh, will also be uh, bringing the angle from uh, regulators' perspective. You know, all these institutions are going to be key enablers of making this trajectory towards India's net zero promise, which keeps moving interestingly from 2030 to 2050 to now 2070. Uh, but I believe we are in the right direction and making positive changes. So uh, with that, uh, I would uh, request uh, 
uh, Professor uh, Sanket Mahapatra uh, to give a brief introduction about the panels uh, and extend the series of welcome. Over to you. Thank you, everyone. Um, uh, and um, as Professor Anish Shugatan mentioned, uh, we have an exciting lineup of speakers, panel discussions, and paper presentations. Um, so the first panel discussion is about uh, policy design for sustainability. Uh, it features uh, Sri Amit Sinha, general manager of the Sustainable Finance Group, which has been created about two years back uh, within the Department of Regulation at the Reserve Bank of India. Uh, we will also have uh, Dr. Prasan Modak, managing director of the Environmental Management Center Private Limited, and uh, we'll have Professor Namrata Chindarkar, uh, who's the who's a faculty at IIM Ahmedabad and also the chair of the JSW School of Public Policy um, at our institute. So we'll have another panel discussion in the afternoon um, that will focus on the role of innovative startups in driving sustainability. Uh, there we'll have uh, a couple of startups, uh, the, the founders of a couple of startups. Uh, Satish Ramchandani, uh, the co-founder of uh, Updapt, Bhagyashri Bansali, founder and CEO of the Disposal Company, and Bhakta Keshavachar, co-founder and CEO of Chara Technologies. Uh, and tomorrow we'll have a third panel, uh, which is about sustainable finance and investment. Uh, and that includes uh, Professor Carolyn Flammer, uh, who's also a keynote speaker, and uh, Mr. Manpreet Singh, who is a partner at PwC. So I would like to thank the organizing team um, for, of both the centers for a smooth collaboration between the Center for ESG Research and the Mishra Center for Financial Markets and Economy, and especially to Professor Anish Sugathan and Professor Naman Desai for making it happen. Um, so I'll now request uh, Professor Naman Desai to give an overview of the research paper presentations. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sanket. So good morning and welcome to all the people present in person and um, all attending on Zoom uh, in webinar mode. We do talk about promoting ESG. So there were people who said that you would not like to spend any carbon credits traveling to Ahmedabad. So if you could attend the sessions over Zoom, it would be much better. Um, they just wanted to chime in, listen into the sessions rather than be active participants. So we do have uh, quite a few people attending in webinar mode for all the panels. Um, as far as the paper presentations go, we have six concurrent uh, uh, tracks um, for the paper presentation. And for the first time in India, we have a conference, which is, we have had other conferences like this, but not with this um, sharp focus on ESG, sustainable finance, and so on. And um, when we think about the, uh, uh, the uh, broad topics, so we have six broad topics over which the uh, papers will be presented. Um, we have topics include involving ESG and regulatory mechanisms, climate change and macroeconomics, uh, green finance, corporate governance, uh, investor behavior and sustainable value creation. So I hope um, uh, this will be an enriching experience for all the participants and you will go back um, with some good research ideas of your own after attending this uh, conference. So welcome once again and uh, have a great uh, next two days. Yeah, thanks. So uh, we will start by uh, you know a warm welcome and invitation uh, to Professor uh, Flammer, who is our uh, keynote speaker, and also to Mr. Amit Sinha, who is our uh, next uh, keynote speaker. I would uh, request both of you to please uh, come over uh, the stage and. <clears throat> requesting our co-chairs uh, to please uh, facilitate them with a all right uh, oh, um, welcome professor uh, flammer now it's time for me to read the full uh, cv okay um, <clears throat> <laughs> uh, it's it's available uh, in in the in the brochure. Professor Flammer is a professor of international and public affairs and of climate at the Columbia University, um, and also a joint appointment with the Columbia Business School. Uh, she's also a research associate at uh, NBER and a research member of the European Corporate Governance Institute. Uh, she's an expert in sustainable investing, 
and a recipient of numerous prestigious awards. Uh, the Web of Science ranked her research among the top 100 highly cited researchers uh, in the economics and business profession in terms of impact over the last 10 years. Uh, at Columbia, she serves as the director of uh, CEPA's Sustainable Investing Research uh, Initiative. She also serves as the president of the Alliance uh, for Research and Corporate Sustainability. I just checked up, they have a conference coming up. So if you have any papers, please do send over. I am planning to send one. Uh, <clears throat> she's also a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on the Future of Responsible Investing, and she's an associate editor of both Management Science and Strategic Management uh, Journal. Warm welcome, uh, Professor Carolyn. Thank you so much. Let me let me set up your presentation and over to you. Yes. Excellent. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much for the warm welcome and for the invitation. And I very much look forward to the conference, actually, to all the panel discussions and to the paper presentations. And thanks for joining. So let me share with you where, you know, my thoughts about responsible capitalism. Um, what do we know from research, but also where do I think the field should be going? I'm not saying we are there yet, but this is where I see we, we need to go in the future, okay? So let me get started with the perspective from the real economy and then afterwards move over to the financial sector. In my view, it's always very important to understand that interrelationship between the real economy and finance to see how can they, um, well, on one hand, how do they interact, but also how can you potentially influence each other? All right, so let me get, started with the real economy's perspective. So from a corporate perspective, the big big picture question is, do company social and environmental responsible practices help improve their competitiveness? And the short answer to this question seems to be, yes, they can. Not always, of course not always. Think about innovation and, and entrepreneurship. We typically think that innovation and entrepreneurship on average are valuable for both the companies as well as the broader economy. But let's face it, most R&D efforts and most entrepreneurs, they fail, okay? So again, on average, company social and environmental responsible practices can be beneficial. And you can see this along several dimensions. For example, and by the way, sorry for this um, shameless self-citation here, uh, but I want to provide you with some kind of uh, research uh, resources about on what basis do I say, do I make those claims here, okay? So for example, we, we can see this, that um, company social and environmental responsible practice can help foster innovation and prevent knowledge leakage. It can enhance employee governance. It can help companies attract, motivate, and retain talented employees. And it can also help companies differentiate themselves from their competitors on the product market and on the market for government procurement contracts. And these practices can also help sustain their competitiveness during times of economic crisis. Now, this study was, um, uh, you know, during the kind of financial crisis, looking at the financial crisis. 
But there are similar studies out there that have looked at the COVID crisis and they find very similar results that companies' social environment response practices allow them to become more resilient and uh, come out of the crisis in a stronger way than other companies. So given these kind of positive um, aspects, it's perhaps not surprising that companies' social and environmental responsible practices can positively affect shareholders' perceptions and shareholders' returns. So the bottom line is that companies' social and environmental responsible practices can be beneficial to companies. And as such, you would expect that the E and S practices of these companies should be an integral part of corporate governance and corporate strategy. Yet, you know it as well as I do, this is often not considered to be the case, okay? Most often, we don't consider environment and social responsible practices as core to business. And this begs the question of why not? Now, one potential reason is that there's a lack of good governance practices, such as a lack of long-term orientation and a lot, lack of private incentives to care about these societal and environmental, environmental issues. <laughs> Sorry, seems like my, my language skills this morning um, uh, seem to suffer from a jet lag or something like that. So um, I, I will warm up as, as I speak. Anyway, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, I'm, all, I'm all good, <laughs> thank you. So now in, in these two studies, I'm gonna briefly talk about these a little bit uh, longer in a, in a short little while, but in these two, two studies, we show that well-designed governance practices, for example, the linking of compensation to long-term financial performance or to specific environmental and social practices can help improve the governance of the companies, improve their firm value, and also improve the social and environmental practices of the company. Okay, so bottom line, the E and S of E, S and G are not separate, but rather an integral part of G. In other words, governance is a function of the environmental social practices of a company. Now, before I move on, let's take a step back and look at what are these different forces and, and um, pressures that managers face, okay? So as a manager, you realize that you've, you are exposed to increasing risks and costs associated with climate change, be it increased energy demand, damage of coastal property and infrastructure, um, leading to a decrease in public health, water supply, agricultural production, et cetera. Um, also, governments increasingly take actions to curb cl climate change. The prime example is the Paris Agreement, in which 195 nations agreed to limit global warming to below 2 degrees Celsius. And actually, there's research out there that suggests that even the threat of strict environmental regulation can send a strong signal to investors and other uh, constituencies of companies, um, of carbon intensive companies. Okay. In addition to these factors, there's increasing social pre pressure, be it by kind of social activists or also society more generally, on companies' managers to take actions. Okay, and this pressure has intensified with the use of social media. Here you can just have uh, see two examples. BlackRock, for example, was called out to be the largest uh, driver of climate destruction in a new campaign, and Bolsonaro, the well, the back then Brazilian president, um, um, their environmental activists called upon investors to divest from the Amazon, given that uh, they plunder the Amazon. Okay, so. Again, there are, it's not just about regulation here. There are other factors that are driving and putting pressure on managers' day-to-day -day business. And in addition, and perhaps as a result of these different trends going on, even the very own shareholders, investors of companies also make increasing pressure on their portfolio companies to improve their environment and social responsible actions. You can see this reflected in, for example, the increasing number of signatories of the PRI, which is the largest network of responsible investors. Um, the, the, these shareholders, especially in, I should hear caveat that, you know, this is especially in countries and cultures that are more short-termistic, not, so, not very much long-term oriented. So I would say, you know, for example, the US and European countries, they're more short-term oriented than other countries such as um, Asian countries, if I may generalize here, this is a very dangerous thing to do. But <laughs> so in, in a sense of investors want companies to take a longer term approach here, correct? And 
make this also, they are vocal about it. In addition, investors also make pressure on their portfolio companies to improve their portfolio companies environmental and social responsible practices and to disclose their exposure to climate change risks. And let me just give you two examples here, okay, to show you this increasing trend that actually investors care about it. Um, and the first one relates to a study that I did um, uh, some while ago on CSR-related shareholder proposals. I will not discuss the study per se, but I want to highlight this increasing pressure of shareholder activism on their portfolio companies when it comes to environment and society. So here we are looking at shareholder proposals that were submitted to the annual meetings um, that uh, are related uh, to uh, environmental issues, the issuance of sustainability report, social issues such as the addition of women and minority to, to the board, animal rights, health issues, human rights, labor issues, etc. You get the gist of it. So what I want you to take away from this table here is that over time, so here we are looking at 1997 to 2012, over time there's an increasing number of shelter proposals being submitted to companies on these issues and increasingly they get a higher approval rate. I mean, let's face it, the approval rate is still miserable, okay? But there's an increasing trend that other investors are also supportive of these proposals and more of these proposals get accepted, okay? Now you might wonder what are these proposals about? Well, back in those days at least, it was primarily about environmental issues and labor issues. I would expect nowadays it's also the addition of women and minorities to the board and kind of corporate um, the, the reporting aspect that I would expect to see more if I did that study again <clears throat> in the 2020s. Okay, now you might wonder who are these investors who actually are active investors and actively engage with their, their portfolio companies. Well, actually the most, this is in the US, the most active shareholders um, that submit these proposals are the nuns, the religious groups, okay? But they are also phenomenally unsuccessful. Relatively similarly active, but much more successful in getting the support of other investors to vote in favor of these proposals are public pension funds and sustainable responsible investing funds. When you compare these proposals, a possible explanation, but this is correlational here, is that when you look at the framing of these proposals, Religious groups tend to frame their proposals in a normative ethical way that companies should do be, be doing something because it's the right thing to do, while public pension funds and uh, sustainable responsible investing funds, they tend to try to make the business case. And you can, uh, you, can, you can see that this is probably more likely to be convincing to other investors who might just care about the business case here. Okay, so again, this is a plausible explanation. Um, to, to get a bit uh, a, a better sense of why religious groups are not that successful. All right, so very briefly, companies that do adopt these proposals to actually improve their environmental and social practices do show an improvement in their firm value, enhanced operating performance in long-term, et cetera, suggesting that indeed environmental and social practices are valuable. All right, another aspect is besides making pressure on their portfolio companies to improve their environmental and social responsible practices, shareholders also increasingly want their portfolio companies to disclose their exposure to climate change risks. It's clear, correct? Investors care about their own risk exposure, so they want to understand what is the risk exposure of their portfolio companies. Um, and so this relates to another study that I did. And what you need to know is in many countries around the world, there's a lack of mandatory disclosure requirements with respect to ESG in general, including the exposure to climate change risks. I understand that in India, you are actually very progressive here um, and applaud the Indian government for this. Um, not all the countries are this. Um, I, are you recording this? Do I need to be careful what I'm saying? I should be careful. <laughs> Anyway, so for example, the US, the SEC, as you may know, is currently debating about mandating the disclosure of um, uh, the, the climate change risks. Um, it's, it's debating about it, but it's at this moment voluntary, okay? So it, and it doesn't really provide guidance. And so as a result, many companies fail to disclose their exposure to climate change risks and other non-financial information. 
Now, why do I call this a governance issue? Why is this an issue at all? They don't want to disclose. Well, if you think about climate change risks and the disclosure thereof, there might be some benefits that come with disclosing these risks. Um, and, you know, for example, it may help firms to actually manage and mitigate the, these risks moving forward. And so some of these examples include that the disclosure enhances the transparency um, of the companies that increases their firm's accountability in the public's eyes, which strengthens the firm's commitment to manage and mitigate these risks going forward. Also, transparency allows investors and other constituencies, such as the suppliers or buyers of these companies, to engage with the disclosing firms in a more informed fashion and potentially help them manage these risks. Okay, think about if you are a buyer of some company, like the, the producer of some company, and you know your supplier is exposed to an enormous climate change risks, it potentially is a disruption to your own supply chain. Okay, so by actually knowing this, you might be able to better be informed and better engage with these companies to manage these different risks. And Obviously, transparency can foster trust, which again helps strengthen the firm's relationship with investors and other stakeholders. Now, the downside of this is these benefits are likely going to kick in only in the long term or longer term, while the potential costs of disclosure already are materialized in the short term. And these costs of disclosing climate change risk exposure include, for example, um, um, that the disclosing company reveals vulnerabilities that the firms would prefer to keep secret. Um, then also, disclosing these risks entails direct costs. You actually need a human being who assesses these risks, reports them, etc. And in addition, disclosing um, your climate change risks might actually lead to adverse reaction that exacerbates your own exposure to climate change risks. For example, if some constituencies say, okay, I'm going to jump off, I'm going to find another supplier, okay? So given that these downsides of disclosing climate change risks are likely going to materialize in the short term, and the benefits only in the long term, management has an incentive not to disclose these climate change risks unless it's forced to do so or unless it faces shareholder pressure to do so, okay? Um, and the reason behind this reluctance, the, the reason behind focusing on the short term more than on the long term, is also um, um, highlighted in a large literature in psychology and economics. We know from this, uh, this literature that individuals in general, so not just managers, but individuals in general, are so-called hyperbolic discounters, meaning we have an excessive preference for the present. Okay, So as a result, we prefer short-term rewards over long-term rewards, even if long-term rewards are substantially higher. Now for managers, this myopic behavior tends to be reinforced by short-term compensation, short-term pressure to meet or beat analyst expectations and career concerns. Think about in your own country, what is the average tenure of a CEO? In the US, certainly it's not very long, correct? And if you feel that if you underperform, if you don't meet the numbers in the short term and you're going to get fired, you're going to focus even more on the short term. Okay. So as a result, managers might actually be much more myopic than their own investors. And as a result, don't act in the best interest of the company. So we call this a time-based agency conflict here. Okay. So what are the implications of this time-based agency conflict for the voluntary climate risk disclosure, well, managers may put more weight on the potential downside of disclosing their climate risk exposure as opposed to the longer term benefits. And in addition, management is likely going to focus on those stakeholders that um, have short term financial implications for the for their company's performance, as opposed to on stakeholders that would be very much material and valuable for the firm in the long term. But again, they don't have short-term consequences. So, so, in other words, in absence of public governance, so unless the SEC or the government regulation requires companies to disclose their exposure to climate change risks, companies are compelled not to disclose their exposure to these risks. Okay. Now, um, when you think about adaptation to climate change risks, this is also... Um, 
actually another concern, correct? So now think about managers tend to be short-term oriented. They tend to only engage investment strategies that um, have shorter term financial implications for their firm as opposed to longer term. That also means they might be reluctant to actually adapt to climate risks. And this is confirmed by a recent study. She's actually, Shelley is a former PhD student of mine who is now junior faculty at London Business School. She looks at whether or not companies adapt their business strategies to physical uh, climate change risks. And she finds that only about 23% of the companies adapt in some way. And those companies that do, they tend to try to do the quick fixes as opposed to fundamentally changing the business strategy. Okay, so this is potentially alerting because it could potentially imply we are absolutely, not absolutely, I should not use that term, but it could imply that we are underprepared for facing climate change. Okay, well, on that positive note, <laughs> so, you know, let's take these trends together, correct? So we have increasing risks and costs of climate change, we have increasing governments taking uh, taking actions and regulate, we have increasing pressures on managers by social activist groups and society more generally to improve the environmental and social responsible practices, and even their very own investors pressure companies to do something. So as a result, board of directors may actually rethink the governance uh, practices and policies in place and that the new governance policies that help improve firm value and also the social and environmental practices. Okay, and so two examples are the linking of executive compensation. So this is the first example, the linking of executive compensation to long-term financial performance. And the second example is linking compensation to specific environment and social business practices. Okay. Um, again, going back to, so let me talk about the first one very briefly about tying compensation to long-term financial performance to kind of help managers adopt a longer time horizon and as a result, invest more likely into these longer-term strategies that are beneficial, financially beneficial to companies. This again goes back to, first of all, in most countries around the world is a lack of mandatory disclosure requirements of environment and social practices. And in addition, this myopic behavior that I discussed before, okay? So um, as I mentioned, given this myopic behavior, given this time-based agency conflict, what board of directors can do is time compensation to these longer-term financial goals to redirect their attention. Um, and we indeed find that companies that do this those managers engaging more longer term investment strategies, including innovation and including environmental social practices, and it helps improve their firm value. Okay. Another practice is time compensation to specific environmental and social practices. This um, practice is also called CSR contracting, pay for social environment performance. It's also called ESG linked compensation. Strictly speaking, it's ES linked compensation. It has different terms, but it all really boils down to time compensation, not to short term financial performance, but rather environment social practices. Um, this, if you think about it again, what's going on here? Again, you take this manager who tends to be short term oriented and focusing on stakeholders that have short term financial implications of the company. So to, to redirect their attention by tying the compensation to uh, stakeholders that that are available to the company in the long term, you can um, uh, you can again redirect your attention. Now the question is to which stakeholders do you tie this compensation to? There is no need to tie the compensation to stakeholders the manager pays attention to already anyway. That might just mean it's a waste of money and you just pay more for something they do already. Correct. Right? So you will think careful. Want to think carefully about what stakeholders are important to your firm in the long term and don't already have financial implications in the short term. So meaning, unless you incentivize the manager, he or she would ignore those stakeholders, okay? Um, all right, so key findings of both studies are basically already said it. So these kind of longer term environment social incentives 
can enhance firm value and therefore basically are good or improve the governance of the company. And obviously they also help improve the sustainable practice of these companies. Okay, so what are the implications for practice? Well, the results and the insights of a broader literature here suggest that corporate short-termism is really hampering business success. It not only hurts the business and the investors, but also society and the natural environment. And that the E and S are an integral part of corporate governance. All right, so with this, let me move to the financial sector, okay? Now, as an investor, what do we know about the relationship between ESG, financial performance, and risk? Well, research suggests that there's a positive correlation between ESG and financial performance and a negative relationship between ESG and financial risk. What does this mean as an investor if you care about risk and return, financial returns? Well, it suggests that actually pursuing or trying to improve the, the environment social practices of your portfolio company should be beneficial for you as an investor on average, correct? Now, what, what are these investment strategies that, that you can pursue as an investor? Well, first of all, you can invest in equity. And one form would be more passive investing, which includes ESG screening and ESG integration. ESG screening, as many of you know in, the, in this room, is, uh, includes negative screening, so-called exit divestment, as well as thematic screening, where you only invest in certain companies with a, let's say, environmental friendly profile, or ESG integration, where you consider ESG factors in your portfolio construction. In none of these examples do you engage directly with the portfolio company, correct? So this is just you consider these factors and make your capital allocation decision. Now, in addition, there are more active ways of engaging with your, with your portfolio companies, which includes shareholder engagement, which is available for larger investors, including institutional investors, and so-called ESG shareholder acti activism, which I just described in PPP4, where shareholders submit shareholder proposals to the annual meeting to trigger change. Okay, so this is more the more aggressive way, basically, only if the management doesn't do what you want, this is kind of what you can pursue, you submit these proposals. Now, when you look at the broader practices in sustainable finance, what is the most common way of investing? It's passive, okay? This includes ESG screening and especially ESG integration. So most things you read in the news, it is about the passive way of investing. Now, what research suggests what is actually more effective in actually triggering change in the real world and influencing your portfolio companies is more the more active investing. Because if you think about it, what happens really when you divest? Well, you divest. Let's say there's a lot of pressure on investors to divest from the fossil fuel industry, correct? Right? But if you really care about climate change, divestment might actually not be the most effective way. Because all you do is clean up your own portfolio. You clean up. Some other investor is going to take up the shares, pick up the shares, and potentially nothing changes in underlying business practice of those portfolio companies you just divested from. It's just you clean up your own portfolio. So potentially more effective way on triggering actual change in this real economy is to stay invested, but to make sure you help the company to transition to a lower carbon economy. Of course, if all the engagement is not useful, maybe as a last bullet, you divest, okay? But in a sense of, just think about it, the most common way of, of sustainable finance these days and where most of the research focuses on is really the passive investing, not the active form. And this is also why I wanted to make clear this bridge between the real economy's perspective and the financial sector, okay? And I get back to that afterwards. All right, in addition to equity, investors can invest in debt, okay? So uh, you're most likely familiar with the green bonds, so the green bonds are, bonds whose proceeds are committed to invest in green projects. Ever since the, the issuance of the green bond market, so here we're looking at corporate green bonds, this market has really uh, experienced a green bond boom. In addition, there has been other types of bonds coming up like climate bonds, social impact bonds, sustainability bonds, etc., etc. A key question of course is, is this just greenwashing or do they really trigger change, right? So what are the implications, for example, with respect to green bonds, 
do we actually really see that these companies that issue green bonds show a better improved environmental performance after the issuance? What I find in my study is that on average, yes, companies that issue these green bonds tend to Im show improved environmental performance, suggesting that maybe the issuance of green bonds is a signal that these companies indeed want to transition to a low carbon economy. Yet these results really only hold for certified green bonds. Again, I think with the, with the exception of India and China, most other countries don't have any public governance in place for green bonds. That means from a legal perspective, a green bond is like a vanilla bond where there's no difference, correct? And so this raises enormous concerns about greenwashing here, because why would you restrict yourself to investing into green projects if all you could do is issue a regular bond and if it turns out to be the case that a green project is the most or well, one of the very viable projects, you invest the proceeds of the regular bond into the green project. So why would you actually issue a green bond and tie your hands up front? One possible explanation is greenwashing. And so this is basically, so in absence of public governance, it is, you know, the results of this study suggest that indeed uncertified green bonds there is a risk of greenwashing there because there's no improvement in environmental performance really of those companies. Okay. Um, and it also suggests that certification, independent third party certification actually plays an important role in the governance of this market in absence of public governance. Now, this current lack of public governance, again, congrats to India for actually having public governance in place uh, for green bonds, um, but you know, the rest of the world, this lack of public governance um, is likely suboptimal, and there are many challenges in the green bond space. And some of them include what is green, the definition of green is ambiguous, okay, uh, which complicates certification. There are multiple taxonomies, which also, again, may impede the effectiveness, efficiency, and integrity of this market. The certification at this moment is binary. This has basically very limited information for outsiders. Probably more informative would be a tiered certification system similar to the credit rating. And lastly, there is no requirement for additionality at this moment. So in other words, companies may, may issue a green bond, but they would have undertaken the project already anyway. They just now call the bond green bond because it helps them attract another type of investor. Okay, so this lack of additionality also means we could potentially, given that we face an enormous financing gap in financing a transition, transition to low carbon economy, it potentially means that companies that issue these green bonds and tap into the pool of investors who, who invest into green bonds, that they basically attract the money away from other projects that now don't get funding. Okay. So lots of potential for making an impact here for you all, okay? Uh, lots of potential for improvement. It's an exciting, exciting field. There's a lot of hope, a lot of potential, but I can also see a, little, a lot of risk if we go down the wrong path, okay? So um, some more developments, and then I do wanna make sure I get to actually where I think we should be going, uh, moving towards, okay? So ever since stations of the green bonds, there has been, um, uh, other types of bonds coming up, as I mentioned, so transition bonds, climate bonds, SDG bonds, social bonds, da, 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 da. okay? Now, some of the open questions, and hopefully some of you may actually uh, pursue these research questions here, are how do these various types of thematic bonds really differ? Do they have a different impact? Do they attract different investors? Are they, what is the difference? Is there a difference? Or is it just a proliferation of greenwashing? A lot of roundtable discussions that are moderating, input, the practitioners very often say, oh, it's fantastic. It's such a growth of the market. You know, you can sell these green bonds and social bonds and I don't know what. And I keep on telling them, I think you're focused on the wrong thing here. The key question is, does it trigger an impact? <laughs> Not whether you can sell the bond, but rather what's the actual impact in this world, okay? Um, and, to transition to a carbon neutral economy by 2050, this not only requires that we transition the carbon intensive industries, but it also requires major investments. And as I mentioned before, we face enormous financing gaps, okay? And it raises important social challenges as the transition to a low carbon economy 
um, involves job losses for some people, dying industries, geopolitical tensions, the jobs created in what might not be in the same place as those jobs that are lost in another place. Okay, so how do you deal with this? We need to be we need in order to actually transition to low carbon economy, we need to make sure this is a just transition that does not worsen social inequalities within countries as well as across countries. Okay, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in a short little while. And now let me get to so I hope this gives a sense of what do we know and um, about ESG and sustainable finance, where are the current practices. And now let me share with you my thoughts of where I think we should be actually moving towards, okay? So let's take a step back. We are in the midst of, and just to state the obvious here, we are in the midst of multiple crises, climate change, biodiversity loss, social inequality, poverty, pick your favorite crisis. The typical response by society and by academics typically is it's the government's role to regulate. Yes, that's the first best outcome, essentially. Ideally, the, I'm not speaking about the Indian government here, okay? Generally, globally. Ideally, it would be the government's taking actions and put in place effective public policies to mitigate these system level challenges. But anyone who has a window and actually looks out the window realizes whatever the governments are doing, it's not sufficient. Okay, And so this puts the spotlight on the private sector, both the real economy and the financial sector. And the question is, what can they do and to what extent to help mitigate these grand societal challenges? Now, when you look at the current ESG practice, sustainable finance, et cetera, our thinking, our frameworks, our theories, our practices are really confined to the portfolio level and firm level. What do I mean by that? I already mentioned, for example, the SEC, correct? The SEC in the US is debating about mandating the disclosure of scope one, scope two, scope three emissions, for example. Now, scope three is not really, so just to make sure everyone is on the same page, scope one emissions are the direct emissions of a company, scope two are the emissions of the electricity and energy they consume, and scope three is basically the emissions of your customers and your suppliers. That's simplified. Now, scope three is not on the table. Scope two possibly. Now, any mandate, mandating anything would be a major improvement in this world because at this moment, in most countries, including the US, it's not mandated, correct? Now, if we don't include scope three, and I can understand why scope three, it's complicated, it's not, scope three emissions are not under direct control of the, of the focal firm, it's expensive, it's noisy, et cetera. There are lots of reasons why we may not wanna include it. But if we don't include scope three, what's likely gonna happen is companies start divesting their most emission intensive operations or they outsource them to some other company so on file, the way we assess the environmental performance of companies at the moment, it looks like they clean up their act. Scope one becomes scope three. We don't look at scope three, correct? So it looks like they clean up their act, but really we make no progress whatsoever with respect to fighting climate change. A related example, let me, let me provide you with a social example here, diversity, equity, inclusion. Many companies, ask the question, how many women and minorities do you have on the board? And how many of them do you have in top management? These are important questions, no doubt. Don't get me wrong here, but they are unlikely sufficient because what it might lead to is a reshuffling of talent from one top company to the other. Yay, we poached a woman from another company, from our competitor, excellent. Yes, it's great for that one firm, that's the firm level thinking. But what does it change in the system? Potentially nothing, because it's just a reshuffling of one woman from one top company to the other. It does not mean greater accessibility and greater social mobility, okay? We can make the same example with faculty. Let me not make it. Let me shift over to the financial sector, okay? As I mentioned, there's a lot of pressure on investors to divest from fossil fuel industries. But again, we need to be very careful. Is it a cleaning up of your portfolio or are we really triggering change in, in the real world? I'll give you two more examples and then share with you where I think we should be going, okay? Um, there is some research out there and some folks saying, don't worry about climate change. We can just hedge away the risk. 
can you hedge away the climate risk as an investor? I doubt it. What you can hedge is you can hedge the risk of your portfolio against climate news in the short term, but it does not take into account the long-term implications of your investments on climate change, nor does it take into account the increasing risks and costs of climate change on your portfolio's financial long-term performance. The underlying assumption of the modern portfolio theory, don't ask me why it's called modern, but that's a different story. The underlying assumption is that the systemic risks are exogenous, not endogenous. So we just conveniently assume away any interrelationship between our investments and climate and the, the changing increase in risk and costs, systemic risks on your portfolio. Okay, we just assume away this interrelationship. And before I get to the, actually, let me get to the last example. Typically, we wonder, um, given a set of rules and regulation, what's the ideal action of companies and investors? We kind of assume these regulations are exogenous, correct? And we very much focus on corporate sustainability performance of the company, let's say the DI practices in place for their own employees of the company. We hardly ever wonder to what extent does the company lobby the government? Or uh, does it does it does it like a uh, pay co campaign contribution money? Okay, we hardly ever wonder ask questions about this interrelationship. To what extent do companies shape policy, inform policy? That also means so we don't any ESG factors, ESG metrics data we have we do not include those actions of companies with respect to policy, for example. We don't include coalition building, lobbying practices, et cetera. So that means our ESG data really only is partial and we don't, we, we can't reward, for example, those companies who try to help strengthen the system, who support the government putting in place certain government regulations to actually put in place effective government regulations that we so desperately need, okay? And we don't punish those companies who, who, who do the opposite. So for example, you, and you might have some companies that have very good DI practice in place for their own employees, but then the lobbying department, which is a different department in the company, lobbies, lobbies against LGBT queer rights or abortion rights or any human rights at the state level, at the government level. Or you might have a company that has relatively good scope one emissions for, its, for, for itself, but then the lobbying department lobbies against climate policies, okay? Those two de departments in the company don't necessarily speak with each other and can tell you talking to, talking to companies, they most often don't talk to each other. And so there might be actually a misalignment of strategies of the companies. So if you are, for example, now a strategy scholar, I encourage you to look at the whole set of strategies that the company pursues, okay? Okay. And last but not least, and I have not talked about this one yet, as I mentioned before, um, we face enormous financing gap, and not just about climate, also about financing the protection of biodiversity, about mitigating social inequality, poverty, et cetera. Okay? The typical way these societal challenges have been funded is through development funding, public funding, and philanthropic funding. But this is not sufficient. And so the key question becomes, how can we attract more private capital into this market to close the financing gaps and really help tackle these issues? This is where blended finance comes in. Blended finance is not new, but it's still in its infancy because we know very too little about what are the best practices. So blending means you blend together private capital with public funding and this public public and philanthropic funding helps subsidize and to risk private capital investments, okay? So it makes it more appealing for private investors to come in. But again, we know very little about what are actually best practices. What's the ideal risk allocation between actors? It cannot be that development finance institutions, for example, um, uh, de-risk the whole investment. So basically private capital investors have a risk-free investment, but get the benefit of these investments, correct? So all these questions, and the question is how do we scale up the global marketplace for planet finance? It's an exciting area to go in, 
in terms of academic research, there's nothing. <laughs> okay. So again, there are missing gaps here, and especially there are missing gaps in our knowledge and understanding about best practices, especially in these uh, um, between the silos, between the academic silos, correct? Economists tend to ignore the potentially the government is, there is political capture of the government and just says we need climate policy to put in place. I agree. But what if there is political capture and what if the governments don't put in those policies? What can companies do and to what extent to on one hand improve their own practices, but also to shape policy, just as an example. All right, so where do I think we need to go? So to mitigate system level challenges and achieve a more sustainable world, on one hand, we need to develop better measures that really help us track progress towards mitigation of these challenges. We need to start adopting a citizens focused approach that takes into account the uh, interrelationship between how business investment practices impact the broader societal environmental systems, but also how these broader environment and societal systems impact business. And we need to create public-private partnerships and understand them better, what works, what doesn't work, and how can we make progress? All hands on deck here. So let me conclude and share some remarks about public funds, okay? So if you take this all together, and you could basically make the same example with big, big companies, that are kind of the universal operators. Here I'm looking at the universal owners, okay? So if you think about it, public funds, which includes pension funds and super wealth funds, these are large owners. They own a large stake in our uh, uh, um, uh, global world. They have a long-term horizon. They very much care about the long-term health and wealth of their economy and they can provide the necessary long-term capital that is needed to make these longer-term investments. In addition, public funds, so that means public funds have the power and the necessary long-term horizon to trigger effective change in their portfolio companies' ESG, uh, ESG practices. This can include, um, for example, you know, that they engage with the portfolio companies and, for example, align the executive pay with these longer term goals, improve the ESG practices, pressure them to disclose their ESG risk exposure, um, et cetera. It also means, and given that they are large institutional investors, many other private investors, small investors actually follow their lead. Okay, so that further in enhances their effectiveness in triggering change. In addition, they can invest in certified fixed uh, ESG in, uh, instruments, and they are probably the players that are most able, capable of engaging with policy to trigger systemic change, um, which would likely help make the environment, social, and economic systems more resilient and improve our overall uh, or decrease overall systemic risk. I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Flammer. Uh, we can take a couple of questions uh, if from the audience, if there are any. Uh, just you can raise your hands and we can pass along the mic. Oh, over there, Chika. Thank you, Professor Flammer. This was an excellent presentation. Uh, the question that I have is, uh, so when we talk about transition, uh, and especially from a researcher's perspective, there are these existing companies that are already into the carbon intensive sector. How do we measure their transition? I mean, how do we say that, okay, and because they're not going to suddenly stop the entire factory, they're going to go one machine at a time, one investment at a time. So as an investor or as a, a you know a researcher, how do we then uh, chart out how are they transitioning? That's my it's a good question, thank you. I mean, if you look at research, correct? Most of us look at scope one emissions. Why don't we start looking at scope two and scope three, correct? To see, do they really transition or do they just divest and outsource? That is one thing. 
Another aspect is also to what extent does a company engage others in the industry, industry peers, you can call them competitors, but I prefer the term industry peers, to take similar actions? Um, or do they engage with policy in any way? Do they make public statements? Do you see what I mean? To shape the public mindset, etc. I'm not saying we are there yet. Again, most of our research is really firm level thinking, portfolio level thinking, but this is where I think we need to really come up with new measures to think creatively. So how do we actually capture progress here? I don't have the answer, <laughs> but this is, I think, where we really need to get to, to think for ourselves. So how do we, maybe it's more process oriented measures um, as opposed to level. Do you see what I mean? Rajshree, yeah. 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 He goes first. We'll follow the covenant of the classroom. You will raise his hands first. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, yeah, I have a question on uh, the scope three emissions, basically. So most of the scope three emissions are, uh, as in, they have to look at the portfolios, right? Ba ba particularly banks, I'm saying bank scope three emissions. Now, what do they do with their existing portfolio if they have given to a carbon emission uh, car a high intensive sector basically what do they do how do they prune this uh, portfolio they already loans have been given first they are not reporting but even if they try to report how do they manage this whole scenario so, so this is again we need to be careful correct so so for except so if your portfolio so you as an investor and your portfolio company has a lot of scope three how do we improve it? That's the question. This is, the key, I think the key is to be sensitive that divestment and just saying, oh, you need to divest for, or you, you should change your, uh, your suppliers might not be the real strategy here, correct? But rather, let's say your portfolio company sticks with a supplier that is emission intensive, but does your portfolio company help their supplier transition? Do you see what I mean? Um, so it's not that we don't just focus on the numbers and the quick fix would be divest or the, the, the portfolio company should just change the supplier. But do you really fix the problem here, by? I mean, a similar story can be made with, you know, for example, labor conditions, correct? If a company decides to move out of a country because of low labor standards and the reason they provide is because you want to protect child, are against child labor and protect the children and I don't know what. You also need to ask yourself, by moving out of the country, do you really help those families? Or are there other ways how you can try to help those suppliers avoid child labor? Do you see, so, so I, again, I'm not saying this is what we are currently doing, but I think we need to be much more sensitive and adopt this more systems focused approach to really think it, what is really going on if you divest, if you move suppliers, do you really solve the problem? And the answer most likely is no. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks for doing this. Thanks for this. This was very insightful. Uh, I'm convinced on uh, ESG investing, but uh, at least with respect to the social dimension of it, right? Uh, there is a lot of subjectivity involved when it comes to social, right? For example, diversity may be one of the most important social issue in one region of a country or maybe uh, like North America, but maybe in India, there is something else which is more important, right? So now if you do a cross-country comparisons and you kind of see the social aspect of ESG, then uh, there's a lot of doubt that creeps in, right? It is it kind of actually social when it comes to India or uh, let's say North America. So uh, means I just want to know your thoughts on it. Um, I think you're right. <laughs> um, and the social is more tricky, so to speak. But I do think if we, again, put it into context, what does diversity mean within a specific context? We might also be better and answer your question, is this really social or not? Socially friendly, right? So, um, and I, 
my sense is very often we use a simplistic way of thinking and then there's also risk that we impose our values on some other country's values and then it, it, it and so I, I again i do think if we consider the broader environmental or social ecosystem it helps mitigate some of the issues that you're concerned about and i'm concerned about too right over there yeah <clears throat> that uh, environment and social factors together contribute to integrating towards a governance factor and they serve an effective governance. They serve to us effective governance. So when sustainability involves environment, social and economic factors. So do you, how is economic factor included in ESG? Is, can you repeat last uh, question that the question is? Ma'am, actually, yeah, you said that environment and social factor to, uh, serve towards effective governance. This is how ESG is related. Ma'am, sustainability involves economic factors as well. So how is this integrated in ESG? Basically, the G, the governance factor is about, we always think about governance in terms of economic, right? The economic value, financial value of a company or so. And so this way, it's automatically integrated. So... We, we traditionally have focused only on the economic aspect. Okay. Um, and governance, if you improve the governance of a firm, basically it means improve the governance, meaning it increases the long-term firm value and therefore the financial aspect. Okay, thank you. Maybe uh, one last question, if you don't have too many. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, good morning, ma'am. Uh, my question is that how can we it seems like most of the managers uh, adhere to what Keen said, that in the long run, we all shall be dead. So uh, perhaps, so how do we assure them or convince them that it shall, the ESG disclosure shall be beneficial in the long run, especially when they have not been doing so well? And how can, how is it that they will not lose out on what they are getting, at least in the short run? And also, uh, when we're talking about the governance aspect, how do we actually ensure that in the first place, the companies look at internalizing the social costs that they um, actually lead to rather than leaving it all onto the governance? Um, basically, it's about the alignment of incentives. Okay, I'm econ trained. Maybe I'm slightly biased here. Okay, <laughs> but... I think a key question is, so how do we align the time horizon of the managers with the time horizon of the firm? If you think about, if you think about the objective of the firm, I'm not talking about purpose here, but the objective is to achieve and sustain a competitive advantage in the long term. There's essentially an inherent time dimension here. If now management scholars in the room, if you think about which management theory considers time, it shot, maybe it's because I'm Swiss that I deeply care about time here, okay? But it's shocking to me that none of the management theories considers time as any, is, is includes time. We don't talk about time. Also, when we think, I'm, get, I'm gonna answer a question, but just, um, so also, if we think about firm value, the way we operationalize it very often is we don't look at firm value, really. We look at operating performance. And even worse, operating performance in a short term. One year, we use one, one year time lag, maybe a time lag of two years, most three years. Is this really firm value? So most of the, of the researchers in management really don't look at, even if they go with shareholder capitalism, all we care about is firm financial firm value. They don't really look at firm value. They look at short-term financial performance, operating performance. Okay, so this is one thing. Now, in terms of time horizon, question is how do we align the incentives of the managers with the firm value in the long term? The traditional way we've thought about corporate governance and how to align incentives is variable pay versus fixed pay. No notion of time here. But yeah, variable pay, fine. But which time horizon? If you provide variable pay, which are just stocks, shares, well, you can sell them any minute. 
that's not going to help incentivize the manager on the long term or think long term in the best interest, long term interest of the firm. Right? Then the manager is even more short termistic and just looks at the short term performance. So in a sense of um, in terms of the corporate governance, the way we have traditionally looked at it, both in practice and in academia, we have only considered variable pay versus fixed pay. We have not wondered about the time horizon. When is that variable pay being paid? And so now if you pay the executives, and hopefully that trickles down within the company as well in terms of reward system and how they get promoted to employees, et cetera. If you tie the performance to the long term, and they get rewarded basically already potentially in the short term. So you see what I mean? So, so that's one way to think about it. Thank you so much. Uh, no more questions. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Flemmer. The, <clears throat> the framing uh, within the systems approach towards uh, sustainability issues it is absolutely, uh, it's fantastic. I think it's call of the, call of the hour. Uh, I remember, uh, a, a paper, 2002, Yuvi Labasnik uh, in Cell, he wrote a very interesting paper called Can Biologists Fix a Radio? Uh, Can Biologists Fix a Radio? And I, I would love to know the answer. Uh, and <laughs> and it's, it's, a, it's a very sharp and witty satire on the way research is conducted uh, as, as small pieces and bits in silos, whereas the problem is systemic. So he gives example, you know, a typical research paper would look like um, A at all, <clears throat> we study how uh, a long rod attached to this box is positively correlated with the sound coming from this device. Uh, and then there will be B at all who would say that we found that the length uh, of, of, sorry, this, the, you know, we build upon A at all, and we say that the material of this ro long rod attached to this box positively moderates the length effect. And there will be C at all who would say A at all and B at all. We build upon their work and we say that uh, if we disconnect, uh, there is a discontinuity with the wire that is connected to the rod and the box, right? And nobody would look at the box as a whole, as a system, and think about it that what is it required, the interconnections between the components, because biologists are not trained. Maybe that was a state of you know, before computational biology and system biology, management uh, research uh, is largely in that state. You know, we talk about positive relationship, U, inverted U, of components, subcomponents interacting with each other without really thinking about what is it so, that we are. I, I don't want to bash the ma management scholars here. No, we are all so, we are self bashing here we, over here. We can as well bash <laughs> the finance scholars. <laughs> yes. In a second. <laughs> are you ready for that? No. <laughs> No, no, but there's a reason why I brought the real economy first, because many of the finance scholars, they don't even think about what's going on. They just think about the portfolio construction. They don't think about the real impact in the real economy. The disconnect right. between the systemic the risk. Disconnect, yeah. You know, it's, it's very real. Yeah. It, it, systemic risk is exogenous, so it's none of my problem. We will continue doing this conversation. Thank you.